Here, let me test it. Excuse me. Testing one, testing two, testing, testing. Testing one, testing two. Good morning. Welcome to Rockledge Presbyterian Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. Glad we're able to be together. Those of you who are joining us here in the sanctuary and those of you joining us via Facebook and YouTube, glad to be together. We are the Welcoming Church on the River and happy to welcome each and every one of you today. There are some announcements in your bulletin, not many. Our office manager, Teresa, is out last week and this week due uh, to a medical procedure, and so she is on our prayer list and uh, requests prayer. And without her able guidance and assistance, there are things that are just not the same this week. <laughs> So I have a few announcements that did not make it into the bulletin. And, um, but first, notice that we are partnering with Family Promise of Brevard County to um, provide assistance to families without, without housing, and uh, they host families. And while we cannot have anyone spend the night here, we do assist by helping families in hotel rooms, uh, those same families that go to different churches uh, will be staying in a hotel and we help with the meals and you see that uh, December the 8th through the 15th, if you can help with just one part of one meal, uh, please let Teresa Riley know. You see her information here on the bulletin. It would be so helpful. This is a new mission project for us, and I hope that you will take the opportunity to participate. Other announcements that are not included in your bulletin include a, a new program that's called Dinners for Eight, Rosemary is um, getting this new project underway for us, and it is an opportunity for you to get to know your fellow church members and friends from Rockledge Presbyterian. Um, it is a great way to meet folks from church that you may not already know. It's a, it's a, um, a group, they plan their own meals, get together once a month for either three or four consecutive months. You share meals at participants' homes, at local restaurants, the church, or wherever that particular group decides. The emphasis is on fun and fellowship, so you do not have to be a gourmet cook to participate. Whatever group I'm in, I would love it if you're a gourmet cook, okay? Just saying. <laughs> 
Uh, so um, simply sign up in the Narthex. Rosemary will be in the Narthex following the worship service, ready to take your name if you're interested in participating in this. Another announcement that is not included in your bulletin is this coming Saturday, November the 30th, there are some elves who are being requested to uh, come here at 9.30 in the morning to help us decorate uh, for Advent and the Christmas season. So if you are willing to just show up at 9 a.m. this coming Saturday, uh, Sue Mann will tell you exactly what to do. She's been dying to tell you what to do. So um, please be here to help decorate to, uh, in preparation for Advent. And the last uh, notice that I would um, tell you about is one of our Sunday School classes, Cheryl Carson's class, is doing an Advent study. Begins next Sunday. It, there is no book for this study. If you would like to participate, you may just show up. Uh, for her class next Sunday. And as usual, our other adult class led by Pat Baggett is continuing as well. Birthdays and um, anniversaries. Uh, this, uh, this week, Tom and Sharon celebrate an anniversary uh, coming up this week. Happy anniversary. 25. Wonderful. And Kay has a birthday this week. And today, Dan has a birthday. Happy birthday, Dan. Okay, how about it, Rob? Are you feeling up for a birthday song? <laughs> Wonderful. I love it when people are here for their birthday. Folks, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. Please rise in body and or spirit and let us call ourselves to worship. Grace and peace to you from Jesus, the risen one. Let all the faithful shout for you. Grace and peace to you from the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Let all the faithful shout for joy. Grace and peace to you from the one who brings the new heaven and the new earth. Let all the faithful shout for joy. Grace and peace to you from Jesus, risen to rule with God over all things. Let all the faithful shout for joy. Let us worship God. Please join us in singing hymn number 267, Come Christians, Join to Sing. join me in the prayer of confession as printed in your bulletin. Risen Christ, you are the Lord of Lords, you are the King of Kings, and no one works like you. We proclaim your realm with our lips and voices, but not so much with our living. Too often the things we want are the rulers of our lives. Too often our own needs get all our attention and not the needs of others. This is not what life in your kingdom is designed to be. Christ our King, you did not come to condemn us for our faults, but to love us into a better future. We rely on you to help make us better witnesses of your kingdom. Holy God, hear our silent prayers of personal confession. Amen. Friends, this is the cleansing water of baptism. God's grace for you and for me our whole lives long. These waters are not a prediction that life will be easy, that life will go smoothly. What it is a promise of is God's grace our whole lives long, always with us, always loving us. 
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's mercy never ends. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. In response to God's grace, let us sing a song of praise. Let us sing glory to God. You may be seated. Please join me. Uh, let us ask for the Spirit's help in understanding God's Word. Please join me in the prayer of illumination as printed in your bulletin. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak to us, for your people are listening. Amen. The reading of the Old Testament is Psalm 93 and can be found in Pew Bible on page 549, if you'd like to follow along. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up. Lord, the seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. This ends the reading of the Old Testament.
Our New Testament reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 38, rather than 37. If you'd like to follow along, uh, please, you may find that in the New Testament portion of uh, your scriptures in the Red Bible in front of you on page 113. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we hear today from John's gospel. Uh, You know, each year on a three-year cycle, we have a lectionary cycle, and uh, we've been in the book of Mark uh, for this lectionary year, but beginning next Sunday, we start a whole new lectionary year. It's what we call the new year. Um, So it will be Happy New Year beginning next Sunday um, as we as we go into a different gospel for the lectionary cycle. The setting for today's text in John is immediately after Jesus is arrested, and it's at the end of his ministry. His disciples have already abandoned him by this point, and Peter has denied knowing him three times. He has come before the Jewish religious leaders and high priests who are furious with his teachings and want him out of sight and out of mind forever. And Pilate, the Roman governor, is trying to determine, well, if Jesus is a revolutionary, because that would spell some trouble for him as the Roman governor. I don't know about you, but I find today's text a bit jarring to read right before we begin the church season of Advent next Sunday. Next week, we begin to look for the coming of Jesus as we prepare for Christmas. While this week, this week we look at Jesus' final moments. It's always the text right before we begin the season of Advent, Christ the King Sunday. It's a little jarring to read the text right before Advent texts, especially since we've been hearing Christmas music since, oh, I don't know, September? Uh, October for sure, yes. Today, we celebrate Christ the King Sunday signified by the symbols of a cross and a crown. We're invited to wonder about such a relationship between a cross and a crown. You know, the crown signifies a ruler with majesty and power, and a cross signifies a gruesome and awful capital punishment, death in that day. 
So the cross and the crown with both symbols were invited to use today a bit of imagination to wonder what is the relationship between the two. To imagine a different kind of rain than the typical rain that a crown symbolizes. Instead of a rain characterized by domination, violence, and economic exploitation, instead of that kind of rain, R-E-I-G-N, instead of that kind of rain, we're invited to imagine Jesus' rain that's characterized differently, characterized by love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. It's characterized by equity, not domination. Equity for all, characterized by nonviolence, characterized by obedience. This version of kingdom, God's kingdom, according to Jesus, is the truth of our lives. What we're here to be and do. The truth. The three-year cycle of lectionary texts from which I mostly preach has this year's text for Christ the King Sunday from John. It has an expanded interchange between Jesus and the Roman authority figure, the governor, Pilate. In this text, unlike what we find in other years when Matthew or Luke is the lectionary text, we get a, a bit fuller picture of Pilate. And we have a sense of some of the angst that he feels in the position in which he is placed. He's a governor of a Roman territory. You remember the occupying country of, of Rome um, was in Jerusalem at the time. It is his responsibility as the governor, above all else, to keep the peace. And the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, is all about keeping people in their place and not disturbing the status quo. Insurrectionists, riots, uprisings were not to be tolerated and would be met with swift punishment, certain death. The religious leaders of Jesus' day knew that well. They knew Pilate's responsibility, and they knew the trigger points to encourage his involvement in a problem they were having, and they used it to their full advantage. For you see, the Jewish religious leaders of that day, well, they had a problem with Jesus. He did not follow the rules. He insisted the larger picture is more important than some of the rules. He said such things as humankind was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for humankind. Some rules could be broken on the Sabbath, according to Jesus, like healing people or feeding people, because God cares more about people than God cares about rules. Not only did Jesus expand the Jewish understanding of the law, he also did scandalous things like eat with tax collectors and prostitutes. He also said they were the ones who were going to get into heaven before the religious people were. So he wasn't winning friends in high places. Jesus had all kinds of people following him. He really did have lots of friends in low places. And he even suggested and sometimes outright said that he and God, well, they have a special relationship. As you can tell, Jesus liked to stir things up a bit. And he liked to get into trouble, apparently, as the late John Lewis talked about, some good trouble. Jesus' life-giving ministry sure upset the wrong people in his day the people with power, so something had to be done to shut him up. 
And it all begins here on Christ the King Sunday. By bringing him to the Roman power authority and suggesting that this rabble rouser is likely to cause some unrest. And Pilate, you don't want that. And by the way, the clincher argument for them was, he says he's a king. They knew that would raise the eyebrows of the Roman official because he knew there was really only one king, the emperor of Rome. Can't be other kings. That sounds like a revolution. They were good, these religious leaders. They knew what buttons to push with Pilate, but Pilate was not convinced. He wanted to talk to him more than once. In the end, Pilate's, Pilate capitulates to their desire because his, he was captive to his wealth and his position. He had a real dilemma on his hands. If he acquiesces to the powerful religious leaders, he risks killing an innocent man. Or if he treats this man according to his conscience and lets him go, well, he risks losing his position because these powerful religious leaders know how to cause a scene. Rome would take a dim view on a governor who could not control his people and keep them in line. So Pilate finds himself between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. Pilate seems curious about this man who doesn't seem threatened by him or his power. But like most people with power, Pilate is entrapped by the love of his position and by what others think of him. So he will do the unthinkable. He will allow an innocent man to die to protect his position. Never underestimate the power of money and position, it can cause all manner of evil. For Pilate, the emperor of Rome, is king, and he will bow to him and to him only. His current position of power and authority is also the king, the ruler of his life. So there's the emperor, and then there's his position. Those are his priorities. Jesus, on the other hand, will not bow to anyone or anything other than to God. And that will lead him to an execution, which makes him, well, a completely different kind of king. He will be known for his sacrifice and his love. Jesus tells one of the disciples, Thomas, just a few chapters later that he is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And follow me, he said. Thomas asked him, Lord, how can we know the way? Jesus' response to Thomas is the same as his answer to Pilate, as well as his direction to us. I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate will ask Jesus an interesting question. What is truth? I don't think he's the only one to ask that question. In an age when Everything seems to be relative and truth is subjective to the person telling and hearing it. What is truth? We wonder the same question as we each have our favorite news source that speaks our language, right? What is truth? Joseph Small in his work on the great ends of the church, which means the purpose of the church, says the paramount truth in our world is not a fact. It is not a doctrine or a private belief. The truth is a person. 
Jesus Christ, who is God with us and for us. The truth is the way, and that way is life. I would say life-giving as well. It is not just an intellectual exercise, not a particular belief. It is a life lived in faithfulness to the person. So Jesus' life and way is the measuring stick for determining truth. Thanks be to God because I need something to help me with the truth. Right? This king, the only one we are to bow to, is truth. So when we live as Jesus did, we live the truth too. And how did our king live? Open and welcoming. Jesus associated with unlikely people, the ones who make us maybe a little uncomfortable. He associated with the sick, the poor, the alien, the immigrants, the children, the fishermen even. (laughs) That's taking it a step too far, right? The fishermen. And instead of acquiescing to the powerful, he confronted the powerful of his day. He did not bow to the religious right of his day, the powerful. He didn't bow to the government, the institution of the church even. He bowed only to God. And in doing so, he brought life, meaning, and purpose to many. He gave his all to God. He did this at great risk to his own life. Any risk that we employ for doing the right thing pales by comparison to the risk that he encountered. If we are to be loyal subjects to our king, we must do what Jesus did. We must welcome the stranger and the alien, the immigrants in our midst. We must work to help heal the sick and lonely. We must work to help the poor. We must speak truth to power. We must live our lives in gratitude and service with joy and purpose. It is not some ethereal ideal to discount and dismiss. It's just, you know... It's an ideal to try to live like, but it, you know, doesn't always work. In living Jesus' kind of truth, we recognize Jesus as king, and we cannot help but be joyful. When Jesus invades our lives, it is as if joy springs up and through us out to the world. Gratitude, joy. The world around us may say truth is relative or that Jesus would never want us to sacrifice our position and our power and our money. But we know differently. To follow Christ the King and live his truth means that it will cost us something. You can bet on it. What a king he was and is a king like no other, not dressed in royal robes, no jeweled crown, no temple palace all his own, no territories to invade and capture, no armies to command, and yet a king who chose to invade our hearts and minds and change the world around us. A king who chose to show us a different kind of community, a different way to live. And this king, yes, does demand something from us. But certainly no more than what he was willing to give. Now that is a king worth celebrating and following. It is our history at Rockledge Presbyterian Church, and with God's help, it is our future too. Today is Commitment Sunday, 
in which we pledge our time, our resources, and talents to help further God's kingdom, God's big dream, God's plan, big overall plan, to further God's plan, God's kingdom right here and right now. I pray that you will choose to be part of God's big dream for God's people in this place. Let us choose today whom we will serve, whom we will bow to. Amen. Please stand as we affirm our faith by stating the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join us in singing hymn 187, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. You may be seated. 
For those of you who uh, forgot to bring your pledge card with you, our ushers have some extras. Raise your hand if you need one. Um, otherwise, uh, during this offertory period of time, uh, you will bring your pledge cards forward and place them in the basket. And any offerings, any tithes uh, that you have, you may place those in the offering plates that are beside the basket. Let us give. Holy God, all that we have and all that we are already belongs to you. Please use these gifts, your tithes, to accomplish your will and purpose in this place at this time. And God, we also ask that you take these pledges from your people 
and multiply them to do, help us do and guide us to bring your people together to heal the sick, to visit those who are imprisoned, to love those who feel unlovable, to feed the hungry, to welcome all. We ask you to help us do that in your name and guide us, we pray. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Remembering our prayer requests, including Teresa uh, uh, for her medical procedure this week, a couple of unspoken requests that they um, uh, have good uh, outcomes uh, this week with their illness and surgeries, and also uh, for Paul, who has surgery scheduled this week. So. Uh, all of our prayer requests. No, not having surgery. Okay. A little further in the future. Yes. We'll still pray for you anyway. Okay. Let us pray. God, we are grateful that you never give up on us, that you are always calling us forward, always encouraging us to look at our priorities and to imagine your kingdom and to participate in displaying your kingdom right here and right now. Thank you for continuing to call us forward. And we ask your forgiveness for when we do the very thing that we don't want to do, as the Apostle Paul says. For when we allow ourselves to be corrupted by sin, captive to sin, so that we do not do what is good and right. Forgive us for when we bow to those things and people that are not our God. Guide us and bring us back, we pray. We pray um, that you will continue to guide this church to accomplish what is good and right in this community and in your world. Today, we lift to you those on our hearts and minds that um, are in need of your special attention. We lift to you, Teresa, and ask for healing mercies for her when she undergoes her uh, medical procedure tomorrow. And we pray uh, for those who are unspoken on our hearts and minds that are in need of your healing presence as well. We thank you for the opportunity to give you thanks and to be with family and friends this week. And we pray that we will be mindful of those who do not have enough to eat all across our world and help us to choose to do something about it. We pray for Paul and for Sylvia. We lift to you Max and Karen, Bill and Glenn. We lift to you Janet and Sue, Les and Lorraine as she makes preparation to return home. We live to you, Kay, who's, um, whose birthday, I think, is today. We live to you, Bill and Pace. We live to you, David. Glad to see him today and request continued healing for him. We live to you, Sandy and Paul and Catherine and Linda and her family, especially in, with the death, with the sudden death of her niece. Thank you for always being with us 
and for help with those others who are on our hearts and minds. And we lift those concerns to you in the silence of our heart right now. Now hear us as we say the prayer you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing. Um, number 263, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, knowing God's grace accompanies you, is with you, is inside you, is out beside you. And may you always know that God never gives up on you, never gives up on us. Amen.